anyone in the background i forgot sorry <laughs> so we're all here immediately welcome to sales chat of the podcast where we aim we give you the tools strategies ideas and concepts and bring in the guests to help you generate a million gp in under 12 months that is the mission that is the goal of the podcast and today we've got both the bodacious cowboy jeff dickinson and joe Shefchik from pt transport we're talking scheduling we're talking data and how do we do it on multiple levels so we win? Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Normally, I pull everyone out and everyone's kind of coming in and out, but uh, I'm not a very good, uh, what do we call it, Jeff? Producer. There days. you go. Yeah. So you guys ready to kick the show off? Absolutely. Let's do this. Sure. All right. Welcome to the HPLS podcast. Live, relevant, and high performance information, conversations, and education weekly. We've got a lot of videos we play on this podcast, Joe. So, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so, before we get going here, um, Joe. Please just share with the audience, introduce yourself, uh, talk a little bit about PT Transport and how could the audience um, help generate some more revenue for you? Sure. Um, so I'm Joe Shevchek. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Paper Transport. Um, you know, I've been here in transportation uh, for 16 years and uh, we've had a, a crazy growth path in my time here. Paper transports a truckload carrier, you know, so anything that fits in the back of a 53-foot trailer um, will haul, um, servicing North, North America at this point. Okay, and you're now you're, is your office based out of Wisconsin? Your yard in Wisconsin? Your your main facility? I'm in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. We've got a high density of drivers and tractors that uh, live and operate in Wisconsin, Illinois, um, Indiana, Ohio. Um, but we've also got a strong density in the Southeast. So Florida, Georgia, Carolinas, um, working really all the way over you know, the Eastern half of the country. Great. And how would somebody get a hold of you, Jeff, or is there an email that somebody, any listener should uh, use to see about capacity and everything for you? Sure. Um, it's, it's my name, J O E last name S H E F C H I K at papertransport.com. Beautiful. There you have it. If y'all have got any freight in those areas that you think you can uh, help Joe with, or you need a quality individual to help manage your business, give Joe, give Joe a call. So today, gents, uh, actually, Jeff, you might even need some to give Joe some business. You might yeah. have some of that Wisconsin freight that you, got. you guys sure. should talk off air. Um, so listen, what we're talking about today, gentlemen, is scheduling. This week is all about scheduling. You know, how do we run multi-million dollar businesses? How do we get the most out of our day, out of those golden hours, if you will? And how can we give some gold nuggets to some salespeople out there that might be struggling with still trying to get their cold calls in, still trying to get their follow-up sent, still trying to manage their business, trying to, you know, entertain or build relationships with their customers. So, um, Joe, we'll start with you. How do you look at your week, your days, your month, your years right now? <clears throat> Sure. You know, so I think when I think about scheduling and getting done those things that you just mentioned, I think about the things that are critical but non-urgent, right? You don't get your cold calls done, you're not building the business. And so the, the critical non-urgent things, you can get through your week, you can get through a month uh, without doing those things. Um, and so 
for a lot of folks, they don't happen, right? All those critical non-urgent things, they simply don't happen. And it's just a matter of putting it on the calendar and, and having the discipline to, to get it done. And with any one of those things that you just mentioned. I like that, the discipline to get it done. Because just because it's on the calendar doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do it. Right. Right. Who's not guilty of that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I often say, you know, your garage, my garage is a mess until my wife needs to put her car in there. And then all of a sudden the garage is clean. Right. It's, it's, it's interesting how when things become a priority, they, they become a priority. I like that you said the urgent, like the critical, but not urgent. Um, it's an interesting way of thinking about cold calls in particular. Because you're right, as a salesperson, if you've got business going, you know, you can go months without prospecting, even sometimes years. And then all of a sudden you lose a customer or your customer loses business that you were running or something happens. And now all of a sudden it's become critical that you get more business. But it was critical six months ago, but not urgent. I love the way you put that, Joe. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I'm a firm believer in controlling the controllables, everything else uh, leave by the wayside. Um, I, I think, well, the way that I go about it is that work your customers to death. You know, your your first shipment is never your last shipment, and your last shipment is always the first shipment. That's the mentality you have to have, um, especially in this industry. And when I say work your clients, I said, you know what? Work it upstream and downstream. There's nothing better than a referral or recommendation from a customer that you're knocking it out of the park. It kind of cuts down your prospecting because someone is always feeding that customer. And as you dig in and you're either moving to you know, where they're shipping to or upstream where they're getting their, their merchandise from, they're always getting fed by someone else. So you know, that's the way that I work on the on uh, the dedicated side, not the transactional side. So I keep myself busy. And then when you talk about scheduling, I'm always thinking in the future, what am I going to do next month? What, what didn't I do this month? And it's like building a TMS, you know, you have your P1s, P2s, P3s, priority ones, and you kind of go down that board and you're like, yeah, I can push this off to the side. I can work on this right now. Give me two days, 48 hours, or whatever it is. Let's knock that off. You know, I don't like going after the low line fruit, going after the hard stuff first. That was actually what was going to be my next question is, um, do you guys find it better if you, when it comes to a scheduling perspective, like schedule the really hard stuff first, or do you schedule the easier stuff first to give yourself a little bit of a, a pep, a pick up, a little bit of dopamine drip before you hit the hard stuff? Joe? I'm a get the hard stuff done early guy, right? Eat your peas first. So. <laughs> eat your peas first. That's it. Definitely. That's it. And Jeff, you're you're along the same line. De- there definitely well. hit the definitely do the most difficult stuff first because then you can breathe that that little stuff. You know, it's like you're coming down off that major hill. You just got over that obstacle, that barrier, and now you can start taking care of the little stuff. But always go after the hard stuff. You want that off your desk as soon as possible. I agree. And I think also, um, also for me anyways, when, when it comes to the hard stuff, um, when that task or challenge or chore or whatever it is, is done, um, you can look back and be so proud that it was this monument. I'm going to say monumental, but compared to maybe all the other tasks that are here, this one is this big. So it's kind of monumental in, in, you know, pr- percentage wise or perspective. But I find that when it's done, it's this, the dopamine and the, the energy that I get is 10 times more. Whereas I speak to a lot of salespeople and they're like, well, you know, I, I, I kind of get a few small things done so I can build up the energy to get the big thing. And I'm often sharing that tackle that monster because that David and Goliath scenario, when, when the Goliath dropped, you can imagine the like joy and energy that David had. And I always find that in everything. And when it comes to customers, when they see you tackling those monstrous tasks right away for them, um, it adds to that relationship. What do you guys think? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely you know and that's what solidifies a really good business relationship is when you're able to sit Mm -hmm. down face to face 
and you start talking about, hey, what's on your agenda? What's most important to you? Where do you want to start? How are you going to ramp up? What are your needs, present needs, you know, and address them right off the bat and then talk about them and help them to get to that goal and objective as quickly as possible. Let all the little stuff go. I mean, that's that's least important. Joe, how do you eat the elephant when it comes to those monumental tasks? Yeah, you know, I think what's on my mind related to your last point and helping out customers and that. In my mind, you know, what's always most important to the customer is what's on their mind right now, right? Mm-hmm. So it really comes, that's all about responsiveness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that, that's the way I like to do it. Um, I think exactly what you talked about is just uh, tackling what do they need? Uh, frankly, it doesn't matter what I can provide unless it meets what they need. Um, so that's, that's what's on my mind. I like that. It doesn't matter what I can provide unless it meets what they need. You know, we had John Brewer on yesterday, and when we were talking, um, John was saying, you know, in our business these days, he goes like, Dan, things are changing more faster than they've ever changed before. And he goes, and you know, what might be a three-month goal at a, at a month's notice, it might change. And he's like, so it's today. It's it's. I love that you said that. It's what's on your mind today, and that's where he's looking. He's not. He's he he knows the 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 goal. He knows the ultimate objective at the end of Q2 or at the end of Q3 or the end of Q4. But he says, I'm not even looking that far out because it's so dynamic today in the way things are changing. And Joe, how do you see in the truckload market? You know, we hear <clears throat> we hear a lot of, well, let, let, let me rephrase that. Depending on where you go for your data, you hear a lot of doom and gloom. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've got uh, Dean and I pre-recorded a, uh, a conversation that we're going to play when, when we're done here because he had knee surgery yesterday, so he's, he's a little bit out of it today. Um, but, you know, it was it's a big talk about where are we at the bottom? Have we, have we hit or are we going to have a dead cat scenario or are we going to bounce back? Um, and with your scheduling and where you are with paper transport and the dynamics of, you know, over a thousand trucks and all these different aspects of the business moving, how do you, how far out do you plan? And what is kind of that break point for you when you have to pivot? If we're talking about planning the business, um, the way that we think about it is paper transport story has always been about growth. Mm-hmm. And so we are always uh, thinking about growth and anticipating growth and putting the all of the bits and pieces in place to ensure that we can grow successfully. Um, you know, we've been historically, you know, we've been market market agnostic. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, slow or hot, we're, we're growing, you know, so, so that's the way we're thinking about it. You know, at the same time, you know, the, the world that we live in today is different than where it was a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Um, the world that we live in today uh, means that we need to be pre-committing on assets, uh, you know, whereas historically it was give us 90 days and we can gather up trailers and trucks. Uh, okay. you know, so, so today uh, we're, we're having a plan for growth, right? We do some things that are a little bit different than we, than we have historically, you know, pre-committing uh, on assets, thinking about how we flex out of them if the growth doesn't come to fruition. But uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's the long answer is uh, we're constantly thinking about growth. Um, and planning today for growth six months from now is the way we're thinking about it. Mm, I love that. I love that. Ryan often, when we're talking, he says, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm already thinking about kind of Christmas presents for the family. Yeah. You know, thinking six months out and saying, okay, what I do today equals what I, the ROI in six months. And, you know, and this, this is why we, we chose scheduling this week because, we're let's face it guys right we're getting into the summer months we're getting to the months where people tend to want to be outside golfing as opposed to working or in the office we're getting to the months where we're going to get a lot of out of offices coming soon um especially now that people are really ramping up the travel we see the travel industry really growing um you know people or staycations whatever they're out of the office and if we've learned anything over the last few years it's and and love your guys' opinion on this, I see when people are on vacation, they're actually on vacation now, which is a good thing. 
you know, you see a lot of those memes where it's like, you know, logistics guy on vacation and he's, he's doing parasailing and he's got his laptop on his, on his, on his knees. Right. But I find now in our industry anyways, um, the more people I speak with, they say, no, I'm, I'm taking two weeks here. I'm taking two weeks there. And my phone's going off and I'm not being disturbed. And it's like that. I believe we have to maintain our schedules in order to keep our motivation, our energy, our inspiration going, because understanding that we're coming into a time in our industry where typically, like if you haven't closed out the business, it's going to be very difficult to close it before September. Um, What's your guys' thoughts on that? I I would say uh, absolutely. I think it's a a great time because typically over the summer months, you know, a lot of the uh, the key stakeholders that any uh, corporation is, like you said, going on vacation. So, you know, you start ramping up, you start building up your corral of carriers, start building those relationships. But one thing that you have to take into consideration, we're getting very close to a critical apex um, as far as which direction the market is going to go, which is that day eight, 181, one, no, I'm sorry, 182, 183 where we're either going to go with the 2020 um, trend line or we're going to stay with 2017 or the 2019. And if we happen to drop below that, the market's going to change drastically. And whatever you're thinking uh, um, as far as scheduling and being prepared, it may not work this time. You know, we've been all through some critical valleys and peaks uh, through our careers and this is a whole different animal. So that's why I'm yeah. saying over the oh, summer months, start reaching out. Like Dan said, you know, start building some relationships. If you haven't solidified an agreement or a contract now, it's going to be kind of tough come September, October. So if I do mm-hmm. justice, get on that phone, start making those calls. Yeah. Joe? Yeah, I think it goes right back to the prospecting thing, right? Schedule it, make it happen. Um, and, and and just continuously get after that. And my personal opinion, regardless of uh, what time of year it is, it's always the right time uh, to, be, to be after that. Um, you know, related to the market, um, I think our perspective is obviously the, the spot market is soft. It certainly would seem uh, to have found a bottom and you know, capacity receding, you know, as such to support the prices uh, where they are. You know, so. So that looks like uh, that's where we are. Um, a lot of the freight that seems to have come out of the market is you know, simply due to more efficient uh, execution of the truckloads. Right, mm-hmm. and a year and a half ago, they were shipping uh, 30% air, um, so just yeah. more efficient uh, execution. So, or on the demand side, it remains to be seen right, where the consumer stands and and how things shake out in the macro. You know, I, I believe that wholeheartedly, Joe. I mean, if you look at 2018, 19 and 2018, when prices started soaring, um, shippers got smarter in how they shipped. Mm-hmm. And so I believe not only the not only obviously the, the the massive influx of new carriers into the market, but I also believe that shippers got smarter. So shippers pulled a percentage of the freight out of the market that would have normally been there. Plus the, the influx of carriers created the 2019 slide. Um, you know, we've got, I, I personally, I think we're a little too early. Um, and this is, this is based on just kind of what I'm seeing and reading, um, to make any determination. Like if we look at just the Panama Canal right now, right, right where they're in a drought, it's lower. They've just implemented now, um, a, 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 an actual restriction in containers that can go through there. So mm-hmm. ships are now loading less containers on, which is going to create more volume, which yep. is going to create higher prices because they got to put more ships in the water. Yep. Then you take that. We haven't even started hurricane and, and tornado sea. Like none of that started. Then you have, and, then, and when that hits, you know, you have all the PETA and all the, the recovery efforts, not to mention, depending on where it hits, it knocks massive amounts of equipment out of the market for extended periods of time. Um, especially with production being so slow and people waiting on equipment for extended periods of time still. I think there's all these variables and it's like to predict what's going to happen. 
Um, I wish. I wish we had that crystal ball. Um, but like both Joe and Jeff said, for all of you watching and listening, regardless of where you get your data, and, and in two minutes here, we're going to bring Dean on um, that we pre-recorded to, to share the data and where the lines are and kind of where the graphs are now. But regardless, there is no better time, like Joe said, than now to prospect. Regardless of what happens in the market, if the market does trend upward for a holiday season, you're in a perfect position to be there to help your new prospects turn into customers and help them with their business. It, it, it's like anything, you, you know, just because you build it doesn't mean they're going to come anymore. No, no. You know, and to your point about the um, tornado uh, season, it's already started. Yeah. I mean, in the deep south, they've already had eight or nine, you know, disruptions down there already in the yeah. Bible Belt. So. But but what I'm talking about is like the big, you know, the big ones that like shut down entire states almost, right? Like we haven't heard it of any of those yet, Jeff. And they're coming. Like we, we know they're coming. Every year they happen. Every year the forest fires happen. And if we learned anything in the last couple of weeks in Canada, it's like on eastern Canada, we, I never really thought of fires. It was always Western Canada, California, all this kind of stuff. Now with Nova Scotia, Quebec and Northern Ontario burning, like that's chewing up huge amounts of resources in this area going North, which normally would go West or South, right? So it's, it, it's all these things change the dynamics of our business. And the one thing that I guess, and what I'm getting at with all of this is, you know, you can use that data, but one thing that, you know, does not change is the fact that you should be spending three to four hours a day, if you can, prospecting. Now, Joe, when you and your team, how, how often do you share with them or how often do you prospect a day? Prospect a day, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it, and you just said, it's, it's a daily process. That's mm -hmm. the expectation. Um, you know, there's weekly you know, conversations about the activity, you know, that we're seeing. Um, because again, for, for many people, it's, it's not the first thing that they get to, mm -hmm. right. And if they let it be uh, non-urgent, they don't get to it. Um, so that's where you know, we raise the urgency, uh, by, by having that conversation every week about uh, the prospecting activity that they generated over the previous week. Um, you know, it's right my, my experiences, that's, that's something we have to do to ensure we're driving after it every day. Yeah. 100%, 100%. And I know, Jeff, you're not necessarily a big cold call guy. You're more of a referral guy. Yeah. Um, do you have spe specific amount of times dedicated each week to, you know, talking to customers about referrals? Or is it kind of as the conversation goes, you know, in the back of your mind, like, okay, I got to get a little further with you. I got to dig deeper down the rabbit hole. Exactly. You know, and we're definitely talking to a lot of different partners out there who are giving us those recommendations, um, which are working really good. We've got a few um, in the wheelhouse right now uh, that should solidify. But um, yeah, I, I concentrate on, like I said, the dedicated business, not the transactional, because I like the better control, the less risk. Because when you know a customer and you know it well, you kind of know how they do it, when they yep. do it why they do it. So um, yeah, that's what we're concentrating on. Now. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, gentlemen, we're going to turn on Mr. Dean Crook to give us our market update. Um, Joe, before we do that, if you just share with people how they get a hold of you again and, and where you're looking for or where you'd like to create some partnerships. Sure. Um, you know, really looking to grow in the across the eastern half of the country, I'm focused on key markets. Wisconsin, Chicago, um, Harrisburg, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Dallas. Um, you know, happy to help in that space. Um, you know, good way to get old me is on LinkedIn. You know, at the name you see on the screen there. And otherwise, it's that name at papertransport.com. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Appreciate it. And Jeff, we will see you on Friday for Fun Day Friday, gents. Absolutely. I'm going to bring a Dean in here. Very good to have you here. And, uh, I'm hoping the surgery went well by this point and uh, yeah. you're up uh, yeah. kicking a rugby ball around somewhere and enjoying yeah. yourself and, uh, you know, now running a quarter mile in under four seconds and, you know, doing I all have, that good stuff, buddy. I hope so. I'll just be happy if I can get in and out of my truck. That's all I want. <laughs> Without a step ladder or do you have a jack? 
<laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's uh, I could drive a truck without a clutch, but it's uh, this is my this is my gas pedal, so I kind of got to have my ability and my need to be able to drive it. So, but getting in and out of it's yes. always a trick. It's a good thing it's not yeah, a cab. They, they give you a. Um, I guess it depends on how it goes and kind of all that. But do they say like no driving for two weeks or because I can imagine if you have yeah. to make a quick move or something with that yeah. surgery, you could really do some damage, right? Yeah, they do. They do say that, uh, but it's more so because of the you know the medication. It depends on how much pain meds you've got, as you know. Yes. You know, driving a vehicle is um, not advised if you're sort of impaired. So that's why I'll. I think it'll be a combination of two things. I probably won't feel like it, and I don't think with major knee surgery pain you know it'll be pretty intense i think because of the it's not just like you know repairing ligaments this is cutting bones and stuff like that that's yeah. that's a whole another level of pain so yes yeah actually yeah. i never even thought of that part of it because yeah you probably won't even be up for doing very much for a little while i mean no. i'm i'm shocked at the fact that they said you're probably going to walk out of the hospital but uh, that that to me is just like Wow, yeah. crazy. I was, but yeah, I was pain close, meds yeah. would be the biggest one that to keep right. it from behind the wheel, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, the last thing you need is grumpy Pete going down the road full of uh full of oxycotton yeah. <laughs> or hydromorphone or something, you know what I mean? But well, sure so I hear that. we what's that? I'm sure some people have thought that when they've seen me driving. <laughs> what the hell's going on there? <laughs> is that not job? What is this guy doing? <laughs> Especially when you're coming around the corner on, on uh, six wheels. So I understand All right. we have quite a big market update today. And we got uh, we got some new data that came in and we got some so I'll let you take it away. Let's go. Yeah, we're only you know, we're only a few weeks away. What are we away from July four? What must be two weeks now? I think it's yeah. maybe about, yeah, two weeks. So we've been looking at July four as a turning point in the market because normally spot rates peak on July four and then just drop right away. And it's one of those seasonal effects that really lifts spot rates, you know, from both dry van and reefer. And for those that are new to the show, dry van rates go up during produce season because produce carriers that haul dry freight switch over to higher paying refrigerated loads. And as a result, dry van freight capacity tightens. So both get a lift, but the bigger lift is in uh, the refrigerated category. Our short-term forecast this week have got refrigerated rates, you know, going up somewhere around five to eight cents a mile, which is really unusual compared to prior years because it's closer to 30 cents normally between April and, and July 4. So not a lot of lift in spot rates. The market is very flat. Spot market rates for produce are still, or volumes are still flat. Uh, consumer demand is wavering. Uh, imports are projected to be flat. So, you know, we've talked about this on the show a number of times. We, we figured that you know, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, sorry, between uh, uh, Memorial Day and July 4 would be a really critical period and we're two weeks away and it just doesn't look like we'll see the sort of volume from produce season to provide the lift that carriers normally look for. So what does that mean? It means that brokers will be able to buy capacity at a lower rate because we won't see that, that sort of hike in rates driven by the seasonal demand of produce. And, it, and the more we look at the market from a spot rate and volume perspective, the more it looked like spot rates in 2019, which if you follow our show on Tuesdays, the green line on my charts in 2019 was kind of fairly flat all year. There was no peak season, uh, unlike all of the other years. And uh, the shape of our spot rate chart right now is tracking about 10 cents a mile higher than 2019. That's excluding fuel but tracking directionally in the same way. Now, why is that a big deal? 2019 was probably one of the worst years for truckload carriers in, you know, since the Great Recession, right, in 20, 2008. And uh, we saw a record number of bankruptcies in this quarter in 2019. It was just, the and reason... Not even was, from small companies, from me. No, everyone, some of the biggest names. And the reason was it was just a slow grind. You know, we just didn't see any peak season in anything, really. It was just a slow grind throughout the entire year, and it just wore carriers down and forced them out of the business. And uh, right now, on the capacity side, I think that's how it's playing out. You know, rates are sort of bottoming out and maybe going up a little bit in the spot market. Contract rates are still coming down. But diesel's coming down too, and what that's doing is it's allowing carriers to hang in there longer, 
which sets up another 2019 scenario. Because remember on the show last week and the week before, we said that this market cycle that we're 14 months into won't be turned by a significant shift in demand. Right? There's no major economic event on the horizon that will change the, the amount of volume for loads truckload carriers carry. It will be driven by carriers leaving the industry from the hangover from all of the record number of new entrants in the last few years. So if it's if diesel drops and people hang in there, then it means the exodus of carriers is going to be much slower and prolonged, which means the chain the, the, the flip in the market cycle from, you know, rates being negative year over year to positive and capacity tightened doesn't happen until later in this year, which brings us to sort of that uh, April period and... Um, of course, the big unknown here, Dan, is imports. What we don't know is whether imports are going to um, change significantly uh, from, you know, normal seasons. There was a report out today on the Journal of Commerce that said uh, US imports are on track to drop by more than 20% in the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year. And, uh, and they don't think the gap will narrow until the third quarter as shippers start to ramp up back to school and seasonal product ordering. That's according to uh, Ben Hackett of Hackett Associates, who produces a great report called the Global Port Tracker. But I believe so, that, Dean. If you, if you look, like, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, he, here's where some part of me, and I apologize for interrupting you, it's just no, some no. part of me says, guys, at a certain point in time, we have to stop and look at what's happened since 2020, mm. right? And, and unfortunately, we went from like right from a really bad year, you know, 2018, 2019 on rates, COVID, mm -hmm. right? And so many companies were pulling so much freight forward, even last year, the first quarter of last year, like up until mm. the second quarter, they were still pulling tons of volume forward. Right. And to me, it kind of says, do you, if you were, if you recall the TCA conference where I first met you, yeah, when you know McKinnon, Challenger, all these major companies were saying, guys, you can't compare right. 2018 to 19 yeah. because it was, the, the anomaly was like too yeah. crazy. And yeah. I don't think we can compare this year at a YOY, a year over year, compared right. to last year. No. It, it, was, it was a different shipping philosophy the patterns and everything we were doing was different yep. um so to me when you say 20 percent drop in like when the, the journal yeah. commerce reported 20 percent drop no doubt no doubt because right. we know and, and this is the big thing that steamship line said is we're not putting the rest of the fleet on the water right because we know it's going to do this yep. yep right so they they kind of they had that elephant brain where they said yeah. we understand yeah. it's it's cyc right. cyclical right, right. the cycle right. So I could I I believe there's a drop. You're right. I you are dead right. Mm -hmm. You're dead right because the volumes in May. If you remember last week's show, we talked about the volumes. They're they're within twenty five thousand containers of twenty nineteen volumes. So we've reverted yeah. back to normal shipping patterns. So yeah, even though the headline says they're going to drop, you know, the first half compared to the first half of last year, they're still at a fairly healthy level. Like they're over two yeah. million. Um, I think it's about two point one million. Um, volumes are down year over year. That's why the year over year comps. And that's why I, you know, some people criticize me for talking about 2019 or 2018, but heck, it was the only two closest freight years that resemble any form of normality. One was yes. up, one was down. I think they're still valid years, even though 2018 is becoming less of a mile of a benchmark because it was primarily a flatbed driven rate rally because of a very strong yes. industrial economy. Uh, we flipped to sort of a uh, consumer-driven economy during the pandemic. So uh, 2019 was somewhat, you know, more more normal, I would think, in terms of saying yeah, it was a loose freight market. But that's where we're at. And, and one of the things that we're talking about on our show today, or, uh, or this week in particular, that will be out today um, on our uh, website, uh, flat, uh, dry van rates um, are sitting right now, I'll quickly pull this up, um, They've been then they've been flat. Um, they've been sitting at about a buck seventy a mile, but they've been flat since Mother's Day, which is really unusual, right? Normally you have a bit of a peak in activity around Mother's Day, and then rates kind of track all the way up until July four. Heck, they've been flat since then, which I think underpins the flat freight market we're seeing because some of the data points that uh, we talked about on our show yesterday 
um, were, um, you know, intermodal volumes. If you think about shippers that move freight on the big class ones, intermodal volumes are down 10 to 11% year over year. Um, cash shipments down 5.6% year over year. So when you look at the volume of freight truckload carriers are moving, uh, Jason Miller's uh, truckload ton mile index down by a similar amount year over year. When it comes out this week, I think it's going to be probably the most telling data point is, is the Michigan State University truckload ton mile index for May. Because in April, it was tracking to 2018 volumes based on 41 freight producing commodities. I, my prediction is May, when Jason puts it out, I think this week we'll be closer to 2019 truckload tonnage volumes, which again kind of sets up this scenario because people are enlisting saying, well, what does all that mean? What it means is that we're hauling less loads than this time last year, not just imports, but less loads of freight. Yeah. But we've still got more trucks in the market from the mm -hmm. massive number of new carriers that ended. And until they, until they leave the industry, and leave means they could either sell their trucks, go bankrupt, or go back to driving for a large truckload carrier as a leased on owner operator. So it's not all bad, but capacity needs to exit the spot market at a higher rate than the total market, which it seems to be doing. And once that gets to a point where loads match the number of trucks, then you start to see the market shift fundamentally, which we don't think will happen until later in the year, which means for those of us listening that are buying capacity, it means that you'll still be able to bid fairly aggressively for, you know, buying capacity for most of the year. But as I said to one of my, and I'd love your thoughts on this, Dan, because I'm, I'm adamant this is what happens. Um, one of our big customers is a big intermodal customer. I did a podcast for them last week. And we went through the market update and I said, you know, you'll still be able to bid capacity fairly aggressively, you know, bid the rates down, but I think it'll be different based on the tenure of the carrier. If you've got a veteran carrier who's been around for a few years and knows their costs, they're not going to bend too easily. They're going to hold firm. You don't want to, you want to be fairer because they, they've been around for a while. They know their costs. But carriers that are desperate, that have been in the industry for five minutes, you could probably be more aggressive on your bids there because they're more likely to not know their costs, which is, yep. you know, it's, it's a, that's a criticism. It's a fair criticism because a lot of carriers join not knowing their operating costs. So I don't think you could say our oh, rates are bottomed out and they're flat, therefore we can bid capacity down, like we can be aggressive. I think it depends on who you're talking to. Yes, because I totally as agree. you know, we've talked about this in the show. If you've got your, you know, I'll call them the horses, right? Your go-to carriers who can just be there, they make good miles, they're reliable. And then you've got carriers for your discretionary overflow. They're the carriers that are probably more likely to be running harder and looking for more revenue and probably will be more likely to take lower rates. 100%. And I also think um, there's twofold. Um, the one that truly doesn't understand their cost, right. the one that just wants to keep rolling, right? Those two yeah. are typically the same one. And then the yeah. one that might have serious paying volume right. at the place they need to go. And because right. of the way the markets have slowed, they're not right. getting enough volume there. So they're going right. to reduce their price to go there. Yeah. Um, you know, those, those two scenarios to me are exactly like what happened in 2019. I mean, they drove, you know, which would typically be a $1,200 lane. Um, some companies want 1350, some want 1100, but typically, you know, you can round the average of 1200 bucks, Toronto, Montreal, Montreal, Toronto. And people were saying, uh, I got 350 on it. And people were taking it like $350 from 1200 people were taking it because they just needed wow. to go or they just wanted to get their, keep their drivers moving. And but, you know, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you and I talking and I asked the question, do we see this 2019 happening mm, all over again where right, 2018, yeah. remember that yeah, conversation? Yeah. I remember the conversation. Yeah. Cause typically if you look at the right. general freight cycles, it's like a right. five to seven year yeah. up and down, right? right. So the market, right. the market, there's rates that are really good for about five years and then they drop for right. about three, right. four, five years and then they come up right. and it's, it was just roller coaster. Yeah. And when 2018 hit and then yeah. the prices went up, yeah. every, most carriers were like, yeah, yeah, man, like buy equipment, buy yeah. equipment, buy equipment. And all these people started coming into the market and it's like, and then all of a sudden, instead yeah. of being, you know, at least 36, you know, 45 right. months, it was like 11. Right. Yeah. And then it it's just shortened. fell off the yeah. end of the, yeah, yeah, it was like, yeah. there goes yeah. the bridge. The bridge just stopped yeah. being built yeah. and everybody fell off the edge. Well, that was shorter and, and higher. There was more volatility. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. So, 
it's like it's like you know especially in the canadian market right like the u.s canada canada u.s market and i know you got some right. data on that too yeah it's yeah. you know that market i found lanes like chicago was like you know 1600 bucks and all of a sudden it was like 900 it's like what and, and right. it was like it, it felt like it was overnight right and i know it right. wasn't it was probably a sequential like two three weeks but it felt like it was overnight and and shippers were that was the first year i'd seen where shippers were like i'm getting ripped off i'm getting ripped off i'm getting ripped off because it was the whole right. eld and everybody right. was basing it on eld and when you yeah. spoke to a lot of the bigger carriers, the ones that you would typically be working with 99.9% right. of the time, it was like, buddy, I've been on ELD for two years. Yeah. Like it was that, it was that mandated <laughs> point of ELD, right. Where everybody just right. like, right. Oh my gosh. And I think it took, yeah. I don't know if it's like taxes where you kind of just keep pushing the paperwork to the side and all of a sudden you're like, shit, I better do this or I'm in a lot yeah. of trouble. It's like, I better yeah. get the ELD in or else I'm in a lot of trouble or, or they just start yeah. to come down in price or whatever the case may be. But yeah. it's like, and I remember us speaking at the beginning of COVID saying, do we see this happening? And we were like, well, you know, who's That's got the elephant and who's got, yeah. who's got the, uh, what was it, Dan, butterfly brain or what was Bra the brain? Dolphin, it? dolphin. Dolphin, yes, dolphin, yeah. Do memory of the golf. I, you know, I remember saying to you, oh, I think they'll learn their lesson. Well, I was <laughs> wrong. Wow, was I so wrong? No, no they didn't yeah. learn their lesson. They went the other way. They, cut, they went all in. And mm. I thought, wow, there's a lot of new people that weren't listening to you and I, clearly. Right, they hadn't listened to the podcast. Like, it's going to yep. be a must listen to. If it, you're doing I don't this understand industry. why they wouldn't have listened to it. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, come on. Yeah, I'm but, a, they, but you know what? Here's the difference. Big difference. They yeah. probably paid twice as much for the equipment than they should have oh, paid, yeah. which means oh, their yeah. expenses are so much higher. And now, yeah. Yeah. if they didn't, like, I even look at the housing market. Yeah. If 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 you're on like a variable mortgage in Canada, yeah, you're screwed. Right, because it's just right. it's doing this and like the volatility is just yeah. i'm like yeah. I'm, i said to my wife the other day thank god we locked in yeah because it's like, you got to understand yeah. your costs and and if you're on this variable loan to buy the equipment right. and you didn't lock in it's right. like every month your cost does this and every month the rates are doing this and if the right. rates do this and the cost does this yeah. eventually things are going to sorry yeah. but shit's going to hit the fan and it's going right. to be ugly in that room right and it's, and I don't know, I just, I, 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 I kind of get it because it was like, it was, it was like all the, the companies that were doing right. freight, right. all of a sudden switching to PPE. Everybody was a PPE expert. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and I remember at the beginning, companies were buying PPE left, right, and center. Yeah, yeah give it to me. Right. And then they put the glove right. on and they'd rip. Right. And it was like, it, you know, like it was just, it was, I don't know, but. And it was then, a bit like the I gold rush. Talk about this. Yeah, hey, right. Like, everybody travel said west, travel west, travel west. There's gold in them their hills, yeah. you know, and the everybody's going out. <laughs> I don't know what movie that was from. That was a bad, bad take on something. That was a good one, though. That was good. What movie was that? Was it Beverly Hillbillies? No, that was oil. Like, that was oil in the backyard. That was oil. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what show was that? There's oil in them their hills. And uh, gold. Anyway, so the gold, the gold was uh, kind of. It was the same during the pandemic. People said, "Well, spot rates are so high, you can name your own price." You went through it with your customers moving bed linen to Florida. We had so many examples of great opportunity for carriers. Of course, in rates are high like that, brokers have very compressed margins because they're buying capacity at a higher rate. Uh, and we just, we, I think. Dan, we're still having, I'll call it ripple effects. There's this reverberation still going on. It's a bit like aftershocks after a major earthquake. We are still a fe a feeling aftershocks of the pandemic in the freight market. We're yeah. still seeing it with some products, some volumes, some markets, some lanes. Um, we're still seeing, and there's probably a good, a good chance to bring in some of the Canadian data because we're seeing, um, if I look at the, uh, there was a return to, um, volumes in May. So there was a bit of a recovery in the spot market in May after a pretty weak April. I'd love to get your take on maybe what's driving that. Um, load links network of spot market loads, I think it's based on about 5,700 carriers or brokers, uh, sorry, 7,750 carriers and brokers rate contributions. Um, the May data showed that the network volume was up about 22%. Uh, but still down compared to this time last year. So it's, again, our year-over-year -year comps are, are not that relevant, but they are increasing. The two data points, Dan, that got my attention, which speaks to 
you know, we just talked about some of the truckload volume within the US being down, uh, but loads um, out of Canada to the US are about 32% behind last year, but loads mm -hmm. into Canada are 55% lower than this time last year. Mm -hmm. so, so you haven't got this balance right across the border. And as we've talked about on the show, uh, you've got to be dedicated to go back and forward with loads. Like you can't just, you know, get into the US and take a load from Pittsburgh to Detroit. It's got to be Pittsburgh to Ontario, got to cross the border. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, the inter-border inter play is really a dedicated freight market lane for carriers for the most part. Um, and I mean that from a dedicated capacity perspective, but the volumes are down heading north across the border. And a couple yes. of markets jumped out at me as being really indicative of what's going on. Remember we talked about the produce market, you know, at length, and I was in Salinas a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Uh, produce volumes in Canada, uh, by my estimates, according to the USDA, are behind about 30% year over year. Uh, it was Last year it was drought, this year it's too much water. But uh, Salinas, California, which is the... Uh, salad bowl, the summer salad bowl of the US, where most of our lettuce comes from, iceberg lettuce in particular. Salinas to California, sorry, Salinas, California to Toronto, Ontario, uh, reefer volumes, uh, or sorry, reefer rates are below, 35% uh, below this time last year. So yes. again, that, that kind of reflects what's going on from a demand point of view, and it's impacting carriers uh, all the way across. Um, the other data point, um, there was a big jump in um, uh, within uh, Canada, so I'll call it intra-Canada. Freight activity jumped about 21% in May, still down year over year. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, why would... I understand there's less volume going from the US to Canada because the US market is, you know, volumes are down. But what's going on in Canada that might be causing more intra-Canada volume and a bit more volume heading south across the border? So the way I... and I, I mean, <clears throat> anyone else that wants to anyone watching listening uh, i'm up for your comments as well so i see it a couple of things happening um one is we're getting to the point in summer where we're ontario and canada and all the growers here are starting to produce crops so uh. i'm going into um more of my local flower shops uh garden centers and I'm seeing more and more produce, like tons of fresh Ontario produce. Right. And they're competing with the grocery stores, uh -huh. right? So I just got tomatoes the other day. Uh -huh. Best tasting tomatoes I've had in three years now. From and it was like, time. okay, yeah. so I'm actually yeah. gonna keep going there for yeah. that. Yeah. So it, yeah. It, yeah. I'm now one person that's being eliminated. Farmer markets are popping up everywhere right. around us. Right everywhere so they've actually moved our local neighborhood market to thursday friday instead of just fridays because it's so right. popular now right. um and right. i think because people and, and i'm just talking from a a food perspective right. um i'm noticing and conversations that i've had with farms around me they're seeing probably a 60 to 70 percent increase in quarters and sides of beef huh. and people buying chickens and all that because grocery stores huh. now are so expensive it's kind of leveling out with the farmers. Whereas hmm. before it was like, you know, you'd go and, and buy a turkey for Thanksgiving and it was like $40 for the turkey. And right. it was really good, but it was like, right. I can get one for 20. Now it's $34 right. versus 40. I may as well spend the six and have the turkey, right. turkey killed two days ago where I know it's fresh. Um, I think people are, so there's, that's one thing. Yep. Um, I'm seeing a lot of movement Western Canada to Ontario because we're starting a housing boom here again. Oh, so really? I think lumber and all that's coming in. Um, I, I think carriers, I've, I've met more carriers now than I've ever met before that are only doing inter Canada. They, they have no interest in going to the Very US interesting. Now. Very yeah. interesting. And so one big point is um, I have a friend of mine, he's got, He's probably got 150 trucks now. Um, and during 2019, when he had his, we call them house clients, right? So when, when yeah. you're in Canada and you go to the US, it's yeah. typically house clients get you out. So you bill shippers directly to get out. And sometimes you're billing shippers to get home or usually it's with brokers that you bring home freight. Yeah. And what they did is they parked over 30% of their fleet and what they would do is they they take their city trucks, go pick up from their customers, bring it to their dock, cross dock it onto a, a broker, 
to go uh, out, right? So that what they do, they would do is because they're a trucking company, they broker it to another trucking company, not to a broker that would broker it to a trucking company, but they would use their brokerage division, broker it to a trucking company, and then they would make the money going up because where they were losing money was coming up. Uh, I mean, on, back into so, Canada. Yeah, so just like right. in today's market, right. right? You go from, you know, Toronto to say Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And then in Memphis, it's like a seven to two ratio. So two loads for every seven trucks. That creates right. a bidding war to the bottom. Mm -hmm. As opposed to seven loads for two trucks, you got a now right. bidding war that goes up, right? right. And then, so what, what that happens is they make a lot of money going out. By the time they get home, they've lost money on the trip. Yeah. So it's like, how do you, as a Canadian carrier, how do you make that balance? Is your big customer in the U.S.? So is your in-house customer where you get paid really well in Memphis? If that's the case, you got to get there. And sometimes in order to get there, you got to say, well, how much you, well, I'm looking to pay 900. Okay, well, you know, I got to book somebody for 900. And that's where, unfortunately, people say, well, I'll do it for eight. It's because they're cutting their throat to get where they need to get to service their customer. Because in the long run, they keep that customer happy. When things switch, then they go back to making money. Right. right, you know that that makes complete sense, Dan. Um, and, and I've just just written about it for next week's blog post. Um, we are I'm writing about tomatoes, right? And 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 what yeah. I'm what, what the theme is that you know uh, timing is everything, but locate but location matters more because when it comes to you know there's about uh, yeah, tomato production about ninety percent of tomatoes in the US come from Mexico, about eight percent from Canada, but yeah. 45% of the Canadian imports come across the Ambassador Bridge, right, because all of the tomato production in your country is in <coughs> and around Leamington in the, uh, the area, yeah. Essex. Leamington and, is the largest area for yeah, produce, yeah. Kent and Essex It's counties. like our Salinas. It's Canada's yeah. version of yeah. Salinas. Yeah, yeah. but if, when, you, when you look at the plot of uh, tomato production, you know, we just passed the peak of produ uh, tomato production from through Nogales because most of the tomato production in Canada, uh, sorry, in Mexico it, it, up to April comes from the Sinaloa state. Right. But then from now until November, it comes from closer to around Mexico City, mm -hmm. and that comes up through far Texas. And there's 1,200 miles between the two crossing points. But in Canada, it's very located geographically, 45 minutes away from the Detroit border. So that's yep. where most of your volume is going to cross in there. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a really interesting point because I would yeah. wonder, would that be a cross-docking deal? Would people, would, would U.S. carriers, would it be cross-docking in Detroit or would they be loading direct out of Leamington and then having so to do the cross-border? Most of the time... Um, they're going to kind of do both. So if, if, yeah. if a U.S. carrier is managing it for somebody else, um, they'll do like a, cause Leamington with its, its directionality to Detroit, like it's distance yeah. to Detroit. Um, yeah. you can do drop and swaps all day long and just keep running back and forth. Right. Um, Canadian carriers will pick, typically pick up direct and go. Go, right. Um, there'll be no drop and swap. Most, yeah. if most that are coming in there actually go Detroit and then up and around and come back into Canada. Instead ah. of looping back around the Northern Ontario loop, they'll go right. up and through Minnesota and all that, and then come back up into Canada, up, up by uh, right. uh, uh, huh. Blind River area up north, yep. Northern Ontario. Um, right. So it's like it's that perfect center to go yeah. either way you want to go. Um, yep. You know, it, it, so the, the cross docking facilities, um, what we've seen more of the transition being is drop and swaps over cross docking so uh um, ah. u.s carriers will get a canadian partner right just like drop trailers yeah so most of like all of, i'm gonna say probably all if not 98 percent of the big u.s right. carriers that do ltl right. have canadian partners for delivery right so they go they kind of meet in that buffalo new york area yep. or, or yep. wherever yep. the area is where it's yep. Plattsburgh get to go to yep. montreal and that kind of or the yep. east coast they meet and they they just transload and they come across right. when it comes to the reefers They'll go and just drop trailers and swap trailers back. And forth. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, so it's it's easier. There's less handling. There's you can maintain the product viability. You can maintain production of the product and all that kind of stuff. So you got cold um, chain. It's yeah, not you, a product, you're not disrupting yeah. any kind of cold chain parameters gotcha. or anything like that, yeah. right? Because got it. You know, and not to mention, you know, you start, you know, call it a sk a gaylord of tomatoes, for example. Yep. Yeah. Right, like one little brain right. fart right. and right. 
you've got an, half a skid that's messed up. It yeah. Those forks and just the yeah. brushing and everything, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. it's just it's it's just a a simpler process, and not to mention yeah. it creates a better partnership, sure. right? Where you just create trailer interchange agreements and you go. Um, but I can tell you, like even up near us, around me, more and more people I see as I walk the dogs are building huge gardens. Uh -huh. like even my neighbor um, right. doesn't buy any produce at the grocery store anymore. They it's grow the lettuce. Guy. They grow everything. They grow everything <laughs> for their family. And they had a friend over and we're having a chat and he says, yeah, I went and bought a little farm. He goes, I have like 15 chickens. I have two goats. I hit like, and he has animals that last right. in the year and he'll go and right. buy the animal and wow. he, you know, he'll feed them. And so when he need him, when he has, whole, he drinks whole milk because he's got two cows and he just, right. like, like, and, it, and it's amazing how people are becoming because, because, you know, you look at it, Dean, right. And, and the way I kind of, see it anyways is we look at the market yep. right the market was really really paying huge prices so many people got in but a lot of shippers yep went out of business yep. a lot of shippers stopped making money right. if you look at groceries these days and how expensive it is like it is unreal to yeah. eat yeah. well and i yep. mean eat yep. well like right. eat healthy lean foods that give you good vitality good energy it is fucking expensive mm. it is like, I'm, yeah. I'm i'm worried for my kids not only to buy a home but yeah. to eat well and i i i believe obesity is going to double and triple in numbers in the next couple of years because there's a lot of people that just can't afford to eat well just can't because right. you know you can go out and you can eat you, you know for seven bucks you go and buy a, a big mac meal or something yeah. ten bucks you buy a yeah. big mac meal you could barely yeah. eat chicken breast and salad for ten dollars a meal it's a great anymore. point it's a great point you know? i think we're already seeing and, those trends oh yeah and and i think yeah. it's getting worse like so my neighbors grow everything i said to my right. wife the other day i said next year i'm putting in a huge garden because a flavor b fresh like yeah, fresh, yeah. you know, like, and, and, you know, zucchinis and cucumbers mm. and peppers. And like, my neighbor made me a big batch of curry chicken. He's like, and he's like, and here's our fresh peppers from the garden. And they were so yeah. good, yeah. like so good. It changes the flavor completely. And so, you know, I've got a friend of mine, he's got a garden, probably twice the size of most people, people's lawns. Right. Just because he's like, no, man, when I want produce, I want produce. And, and we have the weather in Southern Ontario to That's grow good. pretty much anything we want. You know what I mean? Like this is like a, I, this is an interesting trend. High prices, and yeah. then maybe there's a shift. So lower truckload volumes could be the result of yeah. my more... brother's grown corn. My brother-in-law's grown corn, right? Like corn on the cob in his backyard, right? right. You know, right. 10, 10, 12 stocks, and you have enough right. corn to feed your family forever. So right. you know, corn right. on the cob tonight. You literally pick it off, put it yeah. in water, and two hours later, from literally from the vine, it's on the barbecue. Yeah. Yep. ready to go like yep. wow can't get more fresh than that man you go pick no. your tomato and cut it up for a blt can't get fresher than that right so <laughs> that's the way i see i see a lot of it going that way right. um, huh. i see a lot more people um growing herbs and spices in their house all year long it's interesting it's <clears throat> a know, generational want, change that's yeah. a generational change Dan. because my parents used to grow vegetables my wife's parents are croatian they grew vegetables all the time in the backyard yep. it was like yeah. Always had a veggie patch. I've tried it. Yeah. But, uh, I tried to grab tomatoes one year and I put um, some pretty potent horse manure as a fertilizer and it just burnt the heck out of them, killed them. <laughs> I thought, and I was thinking, what have these horses been eating? Like, they been... <laughs> because no, I'm not joking. Everybody yeah. said, yeah, put, put horse. I went to the horse farm, put horse manure down. I mean, these things were smoking. Like, they were, <laughs> I don't know what it was, but there was. Anyway. But it, it, I, I think it's honestly the way it's turning. People yeah. are not yeah. counting on, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look at, so, you know, to go back to that for a minute, because I think that, I think as if you're in that market, so mm. if you're in the food market, mm. you need to, to forecast or pay attention mm. to how the food market's evolving and changing, mm. right? Mm. Um, you know, if you look at it, during the pandemic, food companies like GFS, Gordon Food Services, mm -hmm. they would never sell to the public. They started selling mm. to the public, mm. right? And they still sell to the public because they realized, oh my God, why wouldn't why weren't we selling to the public? Maple Leaf Lodge Farms, right, right. They, they have a huge factory, uh, like a chicken factory, 20 minutes from me. They mm -hmm. have a, a, I can walk in and buy any kind of chicken I want. Oh, that's really? I would buy oh yeah, that's right, buy bags of wings. 
What's like in the bags of wings wow. and it, it's, wow. it's cheaper than the grocery store. So I think people wow. are starting to mm. go to these places, which means mm. grocery stores are ordering less. I'm noticing on the, on the shelves, and I don't know if it's an inventory problem, but where they used to have 15, they now have five. And I think oh. it's because it, it's getting wasted and it, it, their, their, their waste is higher, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And you got so. higher inventory holding costs. Yep. Are, you know, tying, not tying up as much cash flow. 100%, yep. Um, yeah, just, um, I mean, I know we're sort of running up on time here. The other, well, and we kind of got off, we got off the highway a couple of times. Here, Dean. We, were on we, got, into, we got into horse, horse manure and tomatoes. And, uh, <laughs> luckily, hey, luckily we didn't get into growing weed in Leamington. Otherwise we'd have been, there right we go. Down a there we go. Hole, there we go. But, uh, it's legal. Like, You're allowed. Apparently, apparently, <laughs> apparently, who knew the other news, the other news that's kind of, I'm watching is of course, uh, hurricane season started in June. And as, as we go to air today, the second name storm is forming in the Atlantic Basin with a 75% probability of turning into a, you know, major storm. So this is sort of unusual to see early storms in June. So hotter water temperatures. Not usual. But, Dean, everything's changing. You look at all the forest fires, which are typically next month. July and August are typically right. the big forest fire months. We were having yep. forest fires in May, in June, California. Right. Alberta, yep. like BC, Ontario, yep. Quebec, Halifax, like Nova Scotia was burning at one point. Yeah. Like, well, you don't if you think about that this early. So the, I think you, they said NOAA forecast an average hurricane season. It's one of the things that can really change the truckload market. It did yes. in 2017. We didn't have as many last year, but they were some of the most deadly storms we've ever seen. Ian was just you know, on another level. Yeah. So I think I think watch it this year. Like that, I think this is going to be another year where we probably see a little bit more abnormal activity, even though they're forecasting average numbers. Um, it's in my weekly update this week, all the named storms. Um, so I think it'll be uh, one to watch. Um, it's You just never know. It's one of those things. We talk about a, a fairly flat freight market throughout the rest of the year. But as we saw in 2017, two Cat Fives completely upended the flatbed market, and it and it's and it was on a tear from then all the way through to about July of 2018. And yeah. That was one of the catalysts yeah. of the of the flatbed market recovery in the southeast. Because remember, the southeast is where you know most of our gasoline is is produced. It's where uh, about 60 percent of all single family homes are built each year. It's where most of the steel production occurs. So it's a huge flatbed region and it's one of the Huge. ones that's always in the bullseye of hurricanes in the uh, from the atlantic hurricane season you know there was one i remember when we were doing a lot of savannah georgia um we were probably bringing in 10 15 containers a day mm -hmm. um and i remember oh gosh this was probably 2017 if i had to guess and a hurricane came through and it, it was like it was supposed to be way worse than it actually was and I remember speaking to my drayage company, and I won't mention the name, but I was speaking to my drayage company, and they said, we're gone. Oh, and really? I said, what do you mean? And they said, 90% of our fleet is wiped out. Oh. I said, but it wasn't that bad. They said, no, you don't understand. It doesn't have to be bad to twist a chassis trailer. <laughs> right. Right. And right. so you start thinking of that, right? So it yeah, wasn't really. just, you know, we look at the catastrophic houses, like lifting up, like in... Yeah. Uh, the one, I don't know, the yellow brick road and like flying all over the place and all that. And it wasn't even that. It was like the, the company said, man, we were good. No damage. A couple of trailers flipped over in the yard. That was it. But those trailers are now twisted. Hmm. And now for a, for a company to fix 85, 90% of their fleet, they're out, they're out of the water. Yeah, we, yeah, and we went because as soon as the storm's done, the ships start coming in, right? I mean, right. everybody just kind of waits out of the path, and yeah. then things yeah. start coming, and it's like business is normal because not much was. It was hell, and right. our Drake cost tripled right. and quadrupled because now we're bringing people in from all over the place to dead hitting. Wow! Oh, wow. huge deadhead miles. Like, and it, right. so right. it it goes a little bit beyond that, like catastrophe. To and, and maybe for all of you salespeople out there, when we're connecting the data with sales this week, you know, schedule that mm. with your customers. Mm. Like, mm. you know, this week is a big week of scheduling, Dean. We're talking about scheduling. Mm -hmm. And what about maybe what a better topic to end it on? And then, you know, right. scheduling for these natural disasters. How, yeah. when are they going to hit? Right. Why are they going right. to hit? What's going to happen? Right. What is your customer's, you know, what is your customer going to do to 
right. A, B, C. If A happens, B happens, or C happens, and then you yep. can relate that information. Yep. But if you don't schedule the time or understand the schedule of when things are happening, yeah, because what, what was it? it 80, 85% of the strawberry crop was gone or unable to be planted yeah. in Florida yeah. when the hurt. Yeah. 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 When he yeah. Hit or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't know, because there's so many unknowns um, about when and where, but you, you at least have the discussion and have a plan. Yeah. Like, have yeah. a plan for what do we do when it happens? What's our crisis management plan? When do we meet? How do we meet? You know, what's the medium? Like, all, all those, ba- get the framework in place is what I'd be doing. Yes. Um, I mean, FEMA do it well in advance. Uh, certainly everybody should be doing it with their customers if they're not already. Yeah, 100%. I agree. I agree. Yep. That was a good market update, buddy. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, and I know we, we kind of got a little bit off topic, but I think uh, we we needed to. I yeah. really do. I think, it, I think it mattered most, especially on Data Day Wednesday, because you know what? The, this is the day where you connect all the dots. Yeah, yeah. We'll know we'll know more next week um, on the show about, you know, the we're only a week away from July 4. I think all of the trends yeah. will be fairly well baked in by then. And uh, mm-hmm. then we'll next week's show we'll be able to pretty well definitively call it. Um, yeah, because we'll be on the we'll be the twenty eighth next week, right? So correct, we're we're correct. literally definitively like we're literally yep. set six days away from the big day. So we'll be able to probably yeah, that'll be a great Not, actually a great week to, to make yeah. our presumptions and see if we're right this time i'll tell you brother if i go back through the conversations that we've had like you're batting in the 98 percentile like your hall of fame already brother like (laughs) without a shadow of a doubt if we look at what we've talked about kind of what we've seen the market do you're in that 98 percentile of being right Mm. yeah like and and that's just data like that's data data telling good data telling you Yeah, what's happening? I love, like, it. You know, Dan, love it. I think it, I think it's also not just the volume, but it's also understanding the market. But having the the color, you know, like you know, how do you back that data up with what's happening in the market on the road? You know, it's talking to you, it's talking to Ryan, talking to Jeff, it's talking to other owner operators, talking to large fleet operators. It, everything's like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle, and eventually, yeah. it, you know, paints a picture. So we've yeah. been pretty good at that. You're right. I love the way you put that. I yeah. love the way you put that. Everything is a piece of the puzzle that paints the yep. overall picture. It That's does. awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> so tomorrow is Mindset Thursday. We are going to talk about how do we schedule our mind to help us win. Dean, thank you so much for being here, my man. Great to be with you, Dan. And thank good you. luck on the recovery. Thank you.